It's always a pleasure to uh, present for you guys. Um, so as she uh, said, I'll be presenting on um, the work that me and my colleagues have done for the um, uh, National Park Service. We, we did this through a, a National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program grant. Um, and we basically were, uh, the goal was to do historical research on Richard Keith Call's um, fall 1836 campaign and then to conduct some battlefield archaeology on the concluding engagement of that um, that occurred on November uh, 17 or November 18th and November 21st, 1836, um, at the Wahoo Swamp. Um, so I'll kind of divide the presentation into two parts. Uh, the first part will basically be like the history of the campaign. I'll kind of go sort of day by day. It's an interesting story hearing all the misadventures of Call and the. Uh, uh, difficulties that they had along the way. And then the second half of the presentation, I'll focus in on um, basically how we evaluated the battlefield, what we found, and, you know, kind of our thoughts on it. So uh, let's begin. All right, so the Second Seminole War um, begins at the very end of December. Um, and uh, you have a few campaigns that take place early on um, but by uh, the beginning of April, they're already on essentially the third major campaign of the war. And um, they have a new territorial governor of Florida, uh, Richard Keith Call. Um, now, Call is very, very concerned about wrapping up the war very, very quickly. Um, you know, now that he's governor, he has a very vested interest um, in ending this as soon as possible. Um, he considered himself a bit of, um, of a military man himself. He had had some experience. Um, he had served as a volunteer in the uh, Creek War in 1813-1814 under Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson. And then um, he had been dismissed just before the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, um, but comes back. He gets uh, commissioned in the regular army. Um, he serves at the Battle of New Orleans with Andrew Jackson um, and then goes on to... Uh, served with him in the uh, uh, First Seminole War. So he had actually kind of uh, seen firsthand of, um, you know, uh, how to fight these sort of uh, uh, asymmetrical uh, wars. Uh, at the beginning of the war, he had actually served as the uh, Brigadier General of the Militia for Florida and had commanded the Florida troops at the First Battle of the Withlacoochee, which takes place at the very, very start of the war. Um, however, he wasn't actually uh, allowed to participate because his troops are essentially trapped on the wrong side of the river. So the early campaigns in the war uh, focused on what we call the Cove of the Withlacoochee. So that's this uh, middle section of the uh, Withlacoochee River here, where it essentially devolves into a series of lakes and wetlands, um, principally on the west side of the river. And then on the east side of the river, uh, there's a wooded area south of Lake Panasofki, um, north of the forks of the Big and Little Withlacoochee Rivers um, that we call the Wahoo Swamp. And this is essentially where about the first two years of the war take place. Um, when the war starts, a lot of the Seminole move into this uh, wetland, these swamps, um, as basically kind of refuge. It's well within the reservation. And it's a little bit less familiar territory for the American soldiers who are uh, uh, attempting to remove them. So let's try this out. There we go. Um, so at the time that um, Call becomes governor, uh, Winfield Scott is already well under his um, underway with his campaign of the war. Um, so he's already beginning to wrap up, and he basically done this three pronged attack. Um, on the Cove of the Withlacoochee without a whole lot of success. He really wasn't able to engage the Seminole in any for form of meaningful battle and certainly wasn't able to um, envelop them in any way to capture large numbers. So basically it just resulted in the burning of fields, villages, um, without any major damage to the Seminole themselves. Um, but, and by the uh, end of April, he's already starting to essentially wrap up his operations. Now, at the time of the engagement, um, this is essentially the, the scene of uh, the Cove of the Withlacoochee. These are marked the different forts that would have been occupied um, during that campaign. Uh, basically, from top to bottom in blue, you've got uh, Fort Micanopy, Fort Drain, Fort King, 
Um, then in yellow, we've got Forts Cooper and Fort Alabama. And then out in Tampa Bay, you've got Fort Brook. Um, so the blue forts were essentially kind of permanent forts that had acted as headquarters or major outposts um, at the early stages of the war um, and during this campaign, whereas the um, yellow forts are temporary um, forts that were set up during this campaign specifically. Um, so as I said, by the end of April, Scott is evacuating troops um, and he's basically ending this wall. Call is still calling for essentially already the next campaign to start. Um, there are a few reasons why Scott is doing this. Um, he's actually the commander of the entire Eastern Department of the United States, and he has other responsibilities. Um, they're trying to remove multiple Native American groups at this time, including the Creek, who are starting to put up a pretty heady resistance. Um, so he's getting ready to, and he's been with, with uh, he's been called back to kind of handle that situation. So he's uh, pulling out troops. Um, and then in addition to that, um, a lot of the um, uh, troops that they rely on are either militia or volunteers. Um, the entire United States Army, had it been at full strength at this time, would have been around 9,000 men. Um, however, as we know from the muster reports, they're often able to put in um, into combat usually about closer to half that. So the United States Army is very small. So the United States government largely relies on states and territories to levy their own troops uh, in temporary units um, for short term. Um, so around May 1st, several of the units that had fought in the uh, earlier campaigns are starting to expire. The Louisians, the Alabamans, and the Georgians are all due to go back to their home states. So uh, short on manpower and then needing to pull troops up to Alabama, um, they start withdrawing this area. Um, and uh, one by one, all these forts are eventually abandoned. Uh, first, the two temporary ones at Alabama and uh, Cooper. And then later, um, the northern ones are defended by, are slowly abandoned as only a single unit basically has to defend the entire northern front. Um, and eventually, even troops are essentially pulled out of Fort Brook, um, leaving behind, you know, what's left of a small um, uh, settler population. Um, so the area is mostly empty and is basically just allowed, the Seminole are, are left to be for a little while. Um, in addition to this, there are also troops who don't really want to fight during the summer. Um, you've got the heat, you have the rainy season, you have the insects, and all of that culminates in widespread disease. Um, as the war goes on, this will be dubbed the sickly season and becomes even more uh, horrifying as the war moves south. Um, but for now, they, you know, they kind of want to uh, cease uh, action for a bit. However, Call is constantly um, basically making calls for more troops. Um, now, in the vacuum um, without Winfield Scott, um, the next in line to command the war in Florida is uh, Major Brevet Major General Thomas Sidney Jessup, who's the quartermaster in general. Um, he is, uh, he'll come down, he'll be in charge. However, he is also occupied in dealing with the Creeks in Alabama. So um, in May, the War Department and the President finally acquiesce and they give call permission um, to assume command until Jessup uh, is able to uh, remove himself from Alabama. So um, the problem is, is call doesn't have any troops anymore and, on, and this area is largely empty. Um, so this isn't to say that Scott had left him entirely empty. Scott had at least provided recommendations about uh, further deploying, deployment of other troops, um, sending down more militia and volunteer units, um, as well as uh, the use of various watercraft, steamboats to be deployed along the coast, and also the possibility of even raising up units out of other Native, Native American groups to combat the Seminole. Um, so all of that is employed in one way or another. It just takes a lot of time. So by mid-July, um, Call is finally told that they've arranged for um, Tennessee to uh, levy uh, 1,200 to 1,500 mounted militiamen um, that will depart Nashville on July 1st. Um, so Call's summer campaign is now pushing, you know, a little bit farther uh, down the year than you'd probably like. So 
like anything worth doing in Florida during the summer, the campaign actually starts in September. Um, you know, ideally the heat would have subsided and all that, but you know, they still ran into all kinds of other problems. So the Tennesseans don't even make it down to um, Tallahassee until September 17th. So this is now several months after Call has been trying to resume this campaign, and he feels like he's lost at least a little bit of momentum. The last forts in the north were abandoned in August um, after they basically lost several officers due to disease and suicide. Um, and basically they couldn't defend the entire frontier by themselves anymore and had retreated to um, uh, Gary's Ferry, which is basically modern day Middleburg, Florida. So um, once the uh, uh, Tennesseans um, arrive, um, he sets out in kind of a, a plan that will start out by um, uh, launching from Old Town on the Suwannee River. Um, which is basically kind of an old frontier town that's there, and it represents kind of his connection to Tallahassee. Um, let's see. Um, so he has kind of a, a, a complicated plan, in which case, but, but it still represents um, some of the previous engagements. The idea is to once again um, uh, envelop the Cove of the Withlacoochee and to set up a series of supply depots or outposts um, in the vicinity to where the army will be able to um, move around wherever they're at and resupply in the field. Um, so basically that starts with moving up to Swanee Old Town and then also sending other troops to other forts to collect supplies and then um, eventually travel by water to set up a supply depot up the Whitlacoochee River. So let's see. Set this up. So um, he sets out on uh, September 19th um, for uh, Swanee Old Town. Um, meanwhile, he sends the Florida Volunteer with 1,200 Tennessee men and militia, and he has 140 Floridian volunteers that will put under the command of the new Brigadier General of the Florida Militia, um, Lee Reed. So what Reed is going to do is while Cole heads directly to Swanee Old Town, Reed is going to go to St. Mark's where there's a small garrison um, and he's going to collect any supplies that he can. If there happen to be spare troops, he'll, he'll bring them along. Um, and then he'll meet with Call um, on the Suwannee River and then he'll be deploying with ships and then he'll head down to the Whitlacoochee River from there. Call, meanwhile, is just gonna head overland and then we'll, from the Suwannee, we'll then head down towards the cove of the Whitlacoochee. Problem is, is when Cole re arrives in Swanee Old Town, where he thinks, like Reed, he'll grab any spare supplies, and if there are spare troops that they can, um, you know, give up, he'll bring them with him. However, instead, he basically finds a uh, town in which case everybody is, uh, yellow fever is run rampant. So everybody's sick, they're low on supplies, and there's nothing in surplus to help him out along the way. Um, the three steamboats that um, were there to meet him, two of the crews are so sickly, he basically has to dispatch them to Pensacola, leaving him with one steamboat, a couple other ships and some barges. Meanwhile, um, Reed goes to St. Mark's and basically finds St. Mark's in the same condition. Um, the, not only do they not have any surplus, their, their garrison is basically starving um, and they're also having problems with disease. So Reed basically has to evacuate the garrison and bring them to Swanee Old Town just to save their lives. So instead of gaining any sort of supplies or reinforcements, all Cole does is basically use up some of his supplies and essentially ends up infecting his own troops with yellow fever in the process. So after a few days, um, he finally sets out. And um, so on September 29th, they set out for Fort Drain. Now, Fort Drain um, had previously been an outpost um, that had been used as a headquarters at the very, very beginning of the war by Duncan Clinch. Um, and it was there to essentially prevent, uh, pr provide protection for Clinch's personal plantation, Old Lang Syne. Um, and so, um, but it had been abandoned, as I said, around um, uh, July when they were no longer able to um, defend multiple forts. Um, such as Micanopy and Fort Train. But he thought that he might still be able to get some supplies because being a plantation, it did have crops and all that. 
And a lot of the stuff had actually been left there when Clinch had actually resigned his commission and got and left the state. Um, and so what happens is on October 1st, they're nearing Fort Drain in the evening. And um, a couple miles out from Fort Drain, they come across a small party of Seminoles. Um, and they attack the Seminoles, hoping you know, that they'll be able to catch them by surprise. They're, they, the handful of people there easily escape. So now the um, calls troops know that the Seminoles are, are at or in the vicinity of Fort Drain. So they kind of do this maneuver where they approach Fort Drain from a couple different sides, and they're going to try to envelop and, and catch the Seminole there. Um, they arrive, they basically charge in, nothing happens. Um, in fact, you know, there's almost this thing where, you know, they, they fire on some livestock, um, but basically nothing comes of it. Um, they blame it on the fact that they encountered the, the small band of Seminole outside um, and that they had warned them. In reality, the Seminole probably knew well in advance when the army had crossed the Suwannee and probably were following them to some degree. Um, now at Fort Drain, he thinks that he'll be able to resupply. Um, but the Seminole have basically either consumed, collected, or destroyed any of the supplies that were left over. So all that, all that remains is a little bit of sugar cane that they're able to harvest and they feed their horses. And this is already beginning to be a problem that they're running out of fodder for their horses. Um, meanwhile, Reed uh, begins his trek um, towards the mouth of the Withlacoochee River. As I said, he already is down several ships from what he was supposed to get, and not all the ships are arriving correctly on time. So he basically takes the Izzard steamboat, um, some barges, and maybe a couple other smaller ships um, with him towards the Withlacoochee to begin to set up a supply depot somewhere um, inland from the mouth of the Withlacoochee. So um, at Fort Drain, um, call requests reinforcements from Gary's Ferry, that one unit of regulars that had traveled up to uh, Middleburg um, was up there. And um, he requests them to join. And October 8th, they make it down to Fort Drain. And he's got about 160 to 200 regulars with him and two pieces of artillery. So we're at roughly 1,400 um, soldiers at this point. But several people have, have, um, are sick at this point and they send the first batch of sick, tr sick troops um, back to Gary's Ferry, and they make the trek all the way back there. Um, so on October 10th, they're ready to set out, and they march south from Fort Drain towards the Cove of the Withlacoochee, and they're basically heading back towards the same place where a lot of the other engagements have taken place um, earlier in the war. Uh, um, so on October 12th, they're getting closer to the river, and they stumble upon um, a, uh, uh, they, they, they see smoke and their fires, and they see a moderate sized party of Seminole um, on the north side of the river. The vanguard charges in, they open fire, um, they uh, scatter um, the party, um, they kill a few of them, and then they're able to capture um, several uh, women and children. Um, this is ends up being known as Guild's Battle. Um, now, when you read the accounts, there's really not a lot of mention of Seminole warriors, even though they're trying to make the report sound like they're noble, it's a noble battle. Um, most likely, they actually stumbled upon a party of women and children that had few to no Seminole warriors in and still fired upon them and acted like it was a, a victory. Um, so uh, they basically rest there before approaching the river. Um, October 13th, they find the river. However, it's been raining for several days. And of course, while it's not as hot as it was during the summer, it's still hurricane season. Um, so it's still been a busy, uh, rainy year. So they find the river um, absolutely flooded. And the first battle of the Withlacoochee crossing didn't exactly go particularly well. This isn't looking any better. Um, the, the fording point where they're at is over 250 yards wide. Um, it's swollen and it's got a fast current. Um, so they begin to uh, go in different directions along the north side of the river looking for places to cross. Um, whenever they approach the river bank, the Seminoles start firing on them um, from the south bank at long distance. 
um, Tennesseans start moving um, upriver uh, towards some of the tributaries coming around from Lake Panasofsky and start trying to find different places to cross, in which case anytime they get even anywhere close to the Seminole, they begin to uh, open fire and they start sustaining losses. Um, other troops trying to cross farther downriver um, just try to go through on their horses. Um, they actually lose men to drowning at that point. Um, so basically anything that they do, the Seminole are just following them. And, um, and so unfortunately they're running low on supplies. Um, so after um, a couple days of not really being able to cross, um, they send a contingent downriver seeing if they can find Reed's supply depot. Um, after um, a day of looking, um, Major Goff returns and he's not, he reports that there's no sign of General Reed. Um, so on October 16th, they basically, uh, call holds a council with his officers. Um, they discuss what to do. The main problem is, is that they're running low on fodder for their horses. Um, so they decide to turn back and march back to Fort Drain. Um, they make it back late on the evening of October 17th. Um, so at Fort Drain, like I said, they're running, you know, they, they haven't been able to, um, they really haven't engaged the Seminole in any meaningful con combat. Um, the only, they were able to only capture women and children. Um, and they actually sustained some losses when they were trying to cross the river. Um, and then they're running out of food and their horses are starting to starve at this point. There's really not enough food to feed large numbers of horses anywhere close to, you know, the swamps. Um, so he basically decides that on, on the 19th, they're going to have to send the volunteers um, back up to Gary's Ferry for more supplies. Um, so they're getting ready to um, uh, march out when suddenly um, an entire regiment of Creek Indians marches into Fort Drent. Um, so approximately 750 Creek Indians um, and 80 U.S. regulars um, march in. So where did these people come from? As I mentioned, um, you know, uh, the idea of mustering a, a unit of Creeks um, had been in discussion since the very early stages of the war. Um, by the end of the summer, um, the uh, uh, U.S. Army had finally quelled um, a majority of the revolt in Alabama, and the Creeks were really on their heels um, and basically losing their war um, against removal. Um, so uh, General Jessup, who was to take command, had arranged for 15 companies of Creek volunteers and organized them into this unit. Um, now, they were to be paid um, and equipped like um, U.S. soldiers, um, uh, and they were uh, officered accordingly. Um, so uh, John Lane, who was to be uh, with the new 2nd U.S. Dragoons, was promoted to colonel, um, the 5th command for this uh, unit, um, and was placed in charge. Um, one of the other notable figures who was placed in this unit was a guy named David Moniak. Um, David Moniak was a Creek Indian who had graduated in 1822 from West Point and was actually the first Native American to graduate um, from the military academy. Um, however, he had actually resigned his commission shortly after receiving, um, receiving it because the U.S. was uh, downsizing the U.S. Army around 1821-1822. Um, so he had volunteered to rejoin this unit because of his previous military experience. He was commissioned as a captain. Um, now, you might wonder why um, the, there would be Creek Indians that would be willing to join um, the uh, 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 combat against the Seminole, and some were just doing it for pay, um, and a lot were actually doing it hoping that this would delay or maybe even permanently defer any movement for them or their families um, to the uh, Arkansas Territory. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Most of the discussion on the military side was how soon should they deport them? Should they wait till the, fam till the soldiers came back to deport their families, or should they just send the, the families ahead right now? Um, the other notable thing is, uh, is um, while they were outfitted um, by the U.S. military, they weren't really wearing uniforms, but they were given white turbans to differentiate them from the Seminoles so they wouldn't be shot at in combat. They would be recognized as allies. 
So this unit uh, had been organized on September 1st, um, had been officially commissioned, um, and had been sent down the Chattahoochee um, River on boats. Um, possibly some of the boats that Reed probably needed to be setting up his depot. Um, and they ultimately land at um, Fort Brooke or Tam and Tampa Bay on October 5th, uh, find a small body of Seminoles that actually occupy the area around the uh, uh, encampment, um, fight them off and basically um, reoccupy the area. Um, so they spend five days kind of scouting out, um, going in different directions, sending different parties, to see if they can locate the Seminole um, or any villages or anything like that. And they even send out a messenger um, seeing if the Seminole are willing to parlay to discuss a possible truce um, that's rejected. Um, so after uh, five days, they decide that they're going to march up and see if they can locate um, Call's army. So on October 10th, they set out, start marching north towards the Cove of the Wifakushi. Um, along the way, they encounter several Seminole villages, burn them, they capture some livestock, um, and they actually get into some minor skirmishes with the Seminole on the, on the south side of the river. On October 16th, at the same time when Call is turning around and having to uh, uh, head back to Fort Drain, uh, the Seminole, or the, the creek, find the river in the exact same condition. It's swollen, um, it's wide, it's fast moving. They cross the river with no trouble. They just build rafts and they get across. What's fun fact about this is they are also a mounted unit. So they cross a river with horses and still get across, while Call was unable to do this. This will come back to haunt Call later in his career, or actually very soon. Um, so what happens is uh, the, the Creek Regiment gets to the north side of the river, they fight another small skirmish. A couple days later, they march into um, Fort Drain. So um, uh, Colonel Lane um, sets up his troops, um, sets up their camp, gets them all arranged, um, goes to General Call, makes his report. Um, everything's in order. His call's ready to, but Call still has to um, send his troops up for more supplies. Lane goes back to his tent and then commits suicide. Um, this basically requires a restructuring of them. Uh, colonel Pierce will be promoted to full colonel at this point and will assume command, um, overall command of them, and then they'll do some internal promotions um, within the unit to compensate for the loss of their chief officer. Among this, uh, Captain David Moniak will be promoted to major. Um, so while the reinforcements are, are important, um, it doesn't really fix Call's problem because Call's troops are still starving and particularly their horses are starving. So the new troops aren't able to bring enough supplies to compensate for the entire army, and they still have no idea where Reed's at. Um, so they send the Tennessee volunteers all the way back up to um, Gary's Ferry, um, a place that we also sometimes call Fort Heilemann. Um, so they have to march the, uh, at best, it's a two or three day trek. Um, and it takes them several days up there. They end up losing two to 300 horses in the process, um, as well as, you know, some men from, uh, from disease. Now, um, what they're also supposed to be doing is, they, is at um, Fort Drain, Call wrote his report to the War Department, um, discussing basically his inability to cross the river, the fact that he couldn't find Reed, and why he had to make a retrograde movement back to, to Drain. Um, and the military is supposed to deliver that um, at Gary's Ferry and hopefully it'll make it up to Washington. It doesn't. Um, in fact, the news of the soldiers um, at Gary's Ferry, they start telling tales about what happened, um, what's gone on thus far. And that news actually makes it to the War Department and Andrew Jackson before any official report does. So the War Department actually learns about Call's campaign from a Charleston newspaper. Um, and there are soldiers who actually are there trying to get supplies and, and one soldier ends up making it all the way to Philadelphia fairly quickly while looking for uniforms and ends up basically kind of providing uh, bad news for Call. So on November 4th, the War Department actually removes Call from command and orders Jessup to take command immediately. 
Um, by this point, Jessup has finished up in Alabama, um, and he's made it, um, starting to make his way down to Florida. In fact, he made his way um, to Fort Brook um, shortly after the Creek Regiment had set out, um, and he was looking for the Creek Regiment. He then has to run around Florida trying to figure out where anyone's at. Um, so Cole's replaced on November 4th. However, he won't receive the message for almost another month. So he basically continues his campaign ignorant of that uh, fact. So the volunteers really have no problems getting supplies at Gary's Ferry. There's plenty of supplies. It's easily accessible um, via the St. John's in Jacksonville. Um, however, the uh, volunteers remain there a lot longer than they really need to because they really want horses. They really don't want to go back into combat as not unmounted troops. They're really obsessed with having horses. They don't really like walking, even though the horses are useless in combat. Um, so what happens is they get up there like by mid uh, October 25th, something around there. They don't leave until November 7th. Um, and even and when they leave on November 7th, they, they've acquired a small number of horses. They actually leave another 25 troops behind to continue to procure more, more horses, which they're able to get some more the following day, and another group of them ride down. So around um, November uh, 11th, um, Call is um, basically resupplied. Um, he has most of his Tennesseans back. Uh, they're mostly mounted, but not entirely. Um, he's ready to return back to the Withlacoochee River. And basically he sets out and marches um, directly south and goes right back to the same place where he was at before. Um, this time he finds that the river is not nearly as swollen um, and he would be able to cross it. However, the Seminole are nowhere to be found this time. Instead, all they find is they find a single old black man sitting there, um, a black Seminole guy, um, just hanging out um, on the north side. And when he's questioned, he says that um, everyone has gone towards the Wahoo. They've gone to the Wahoo Swamp. Um, so Call decides that they're going to listen to what this guy says. They capture him. Um, and then he splits his force um, into two. So he's going to send um, uh, Colonel Benjamin Pierce, the older brother of future president uh, Franklin Pierce, with the Creek Indians and the U.S. regulars on the south side of the river where they'll scour the coast of the Wipikuchi. And Call and uh, General Armstrong of the Tennessee Volunteers will take the, the volunteers as well as the Florida Volunteers, um, oh, which, which I'll explain that in a second, um, on the north side. Now, they reach the river on November 13th, exactly one month from the last time they reached the river. This time, they actually encounter Reed. Now, what happened with Reed was he made it to the river a lot later than he thought. Uh, a lot of the issues with the sickly um, crews, the lack of boats, had come into problem, uh, had become a problem. When he tried to take the steamboat Izzard up the Withlacoochee River, um, they had, uh, he had gotten it stuck uh, essentially on an oyster bed. Um, when the tide dropped, um, the stranded steamboat then cracked in half um, from, and basically was stranded. So Reed didn't have the watercraft that he needed to get up the river um, to tow the barges. Um, with the Coochie River is not terribly deep. Um, so what happens is the lack of other steamboats that had been redispatched to um, uh, Pensacola had hurt him. In addition to that, the um, boats that he needed were probably used by the Creek Regiment, um, which had to not only move the horses or the, the troops down, but also the horses. Um, in addition to that, um, Jessup came down with his own contingent of U.S. Marines. Um, shortly after them, and had also occupied a lot of the uh, the craft. So um, Jessup had actually stumbled on Reed, who had just erected um, uh, Camp Graham, which would later be called Camp uh, Fort Clinch, um, around October 19th. Um, so a few days after Call had already abandoned um, his attempts to locate Reed and his attempts to cross the river the first time. 
Um, so he, uh, so Reed had basically been hanging out for several weeks and unfortunately had been using up some of the supplies that, you know, he had been, uh, that had been needed for the army. So uh, Reed's volunteers are reunited. The odd thing in the historical literature is this gets almost no attention. The fact that Reed suddenly pops up, he's barely ever mentioned again um, in the rest of the campaign. Um, so uh, the, uh, as I said, you know, basically the Florida volunteers and, and the, the Tennessee militia um, go on the north side and they go around the north side of uh, Lake Panasofsky um, once they're on the southeast side of the lake, um, the vanguard stumbles on a, an encampment of Seminoles. Um, they have a small but heated engagement where they're basically able to pursue the Seminoles until they get into the edge of a wetland and the Seminoles are able to escape. The, the military decides not to pursue any further. And this is the November 17th battle that we call uh, Battle of Warm Spring or uh, Bradford's Fight. Um, so from there, they start marching south. Um, and then they find an Indian trail that leads them closer to um, basically the east side of the wooded area, the Wahoo Swamp. Um, and so on November 18th, they're marching along the, the, the uh, path when they basically come across a, um, uh, they, they come across a village. And the weird thing about the Seminole Village is the Seminole Village is already on fire when they get to it. It's a little unusual. It's hard to set a village on fire before you get to it. Um, so not really thinking this is a trap, but for some reason assuming that the Seminole are maybe just trying to burn their supplies and run away, they once again form into two lines and they try to envelop the village, um, sort of like what they had done at Fort Drain. So Colonel Truesdale takes half the uh, Tennessee volunteers and Colonel Guild um, takes another portion of the volunteers, and they approach the village from two angles, um, but essentially the village is empty by the time they approach it. So they form into one big line, and they're just kind of standing there facing the wood line, trying to figure out what's going on, when suddenly General Reed comes riding up, basically screaming to uh, Colonel Truesdale that they're in the woods. The Seminole are lined up in the woods. Um, and this is the one and only mention that you really get of Reed um, uh, when, when he comes back. And about the time that he's making this warning, you hear a musket, a crack of, of muskets from each end of the Seminole line in the woods, and the entire tree line opens fire on the exposed volunteers. Um, so basically, they take one straight volley directly at them. Um, the volunteers, having no cover, just drop straight to the ground. Um, and the problem is, is you can't fire a muzzle-loading weapon from the ground, or at least not very well. Um, it's very, very slow to reload at that point. I mean, they're, they're slow to reload in good times, very slow to reload from the ground. So after um, uh, a moment, they, they're able to encourage them to stand up. They fire a volley, and they basically charge the hammock. Um, uh, that's basically the Sentinel don't tend to like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, they usually withdraw anytime they're really approached. So what happens is you end up with close quarter gunfire. Um, and basically as the, as the U.S. troops um, uh, uh, approach, the Seminole basically fire and withdraw. Um, fire, withdraw. And the dense vegetation um, that starts off with saw palmetto, um, and then gets into more wet, ha uh, wet hammock terrain, um, and then the very sloughs in, in the Wahoo Swamp um, starts to slow down um, the advancing volunteers. And so basically the Seminole will pull back to each um, edge of vegetation. They'll, they'll stop, they'll fire, then they'll pull back to the far side of a wetland, and then they'll fire again, hold their position until the volunteers can make it to them. And they basically do this strategy um, until the sun starts going down. And um, they've been pushed back um, a ways, um, but basically they haven't sustained uh, tremendous losses and the um, uh, uh, volunteers starting to run out of time. Um, oh, oh, I'm speaking of running out of time. And so the, um, they're able to, uh, uh, they, they, they withdraw back and they make an encampment. Now, as I mentioned, they had split the army. 
So Colonel Pierce has roughly a thousand troops of his own, and they decide that they're going to reconnect with him. And the plan was to reunite um, around Dade's battle. And so um, what they do is they decide that they're going to reconnect with Pierce's um, force, um, and then they'll make another um, uh, assembled assault on the Wahoo Swamp. Um, so uh, on November 18th, they set up a, uh, an encamp or November 19th, they set up an encampment around Dade's battle. Um, Pierce's army basically has some minor skirmishes, but only seeing uh, uh, individuals essentially, they basically have a largely um, eventless um, scouring of the, the, the river. So um, they cross over the uh, Whitlacoochee River on the 19th, approach from the south, um, and they're back in camp by the 20th. So on November 21st, with the army fully assembled, they get ready to attack the Wahoo Swamp again. However, they hold back a lot of their troops. They hold back a contingent of Tennessee volunteers first at the encampment several miles away, just to essentially protect the horses. Um, they then set up another um, outpost that holds back a lot of the Tennesseans um, because Call isn't really in good health at this time. And he's not really doing a lot of the direct field commands himself. And so he actually sets up his command post about two miles from the edge of where the previous battle started. Um, and he holds back a sizable amount of the Tennessee volunteers. And the way the descriptions put it are that they held back um, uh, people from good gentlemanly families who it would be a shame if they were to, say, die during the engagement. So basically, these were kind of wealthy people, sons of prominent politicians and, and prominent important folk in Tennessee who don't really want to see their uh, kinfolk injured. So they end up sending uh, half or less of the Tennessee volunteers in there um, amongst with the, the Creek Regiment and the uh, Florida Volunteers and the U.S. Regulars. So they form up at the exact same place of where the engagement started on November um, 18th. And uh, according to descriptions, it's a battle line of about a mile long. The Creek um, Regiment is on the left side. The U.S. Regulars and Florida Volunteers are in the center. And the um, Florida, uh, the Tennessee volunteers who are actually present on the battlefield form the right flank. And basically the engagement starts off similarly as the previous day. The Seminole take up the same defensive position. The, uh, the difference is the um, uh, US force basically just attacks the hammock fairly early on. And the engagement basically goes in the same pattern as it had um, a few days before. Um, basically the Seminole start providing a series of um, withdrawals. Um, so here on this map, um, this map is upside down. So don't hurt yourself too much or hopefully you haven't hurt yourself too much. Um, well, I've got it flipped so that north is on the top end. It's just bugs me to no end cartographically that this map was drawn like this. Um, but you have the uh, Guilford's fight is located here on the southeast, or, or sorry, Bradford's fight on the southeast um, end of Panasofsky, the November 18th and the November 21st battles are, are marked here in red. Um, so to kind of show you, you know, don't, again, don't try to read this too much. Mostly look at the orange and yellow rectangles. And these kind of uh, give postulations as to the positions of the Seminoles. So it sh kind of shows you to the extent, extent that the Seminoles would kind of hold a position and then withdraw and would basically um, take uh, positions at the edges of wetlands and other natural defensive uh, positions. Um, so basically the November 21st engagement follows a very similar pattern. Um, they continue to push them back um, until uh, through a series of wetlands. Um, and the descriptions vary greatly. And that's um, both in the type of vegetation and the landscape that they're describing, and then also the type of engagement that they're in. And this depends on essentially what unit these people were in, because some units never see any combat in this battle, while other units are in the thick of it for a large portion of it. Um, we we'll, we'll also have other issues on, like I said, how they describe the landscape. Um, the problem is, is a lot of these guys are from Tennessee, and they're not necessarily de describing the landscape in the same way that I would today. 
Um, hammocks, for example, are kind of used very ubiquitously. Um, essentially, they're saying almost any place that has hardwoods is a hammock rather than talking about a well-drained upland. Um, so some of the, you know, wet areas that even have like cedars or cypresses, they might be considering a hammock. And then they're also describing the sloughs in very, very different ways um, and some of the, the, the wet areas that they're coming across. Um, so the one thing that they kind of have in common is essentially, um, you know, uh, uh, that, that the battle ends up concluding when the Seminole take up a defensive position at essentially a, a choke point um, in a waterway. Um, in which case there are two lagoons or ponds or somehow wider bodies of water um, that basically kind of protect the Seminole flanks and that they're holding the one and only crossing. And so the, the general progression of the battle is that um, the different forces set out and that after a certain point, um, you know, the Seminole are actually able to kind of um, retreat or withdraw faster than the U.S. troops can keep up. Um, they kind of get slowed in the dense vegetation. However, the, Semi or the Creek Regiment on the uh, extreme left flank are actually able to maintain um, uh, sight of the withdrawing Seminole. And so they're able to kind of pursue and stay on roughly some high ground. Um, some of the regulars are able to kind of follow the Creek and, and follow the same pattern. Um, for example, Major Gardner of the Regulars, um, uh, supposedly his horse's hooves never even really get wet during this engagement. He's able to follow high ground. Other soldiers, on the other hand, are describing um, wetland vegetation, including uh, uh, grass that cuts like knives, uh, suggestive of things like sawgrass, meaning they were going through freshwater marshes. Um, so some of these troops ended up in vastly different areas. But the one concluding area is that they come to this essentially choke point. So first the Creeks arrive, then the regulars, um, then the Florida volunteers under uh, Colonel Warren, um, and then um, eventually late some of the volunteers after hours start, uh, uh, Tennessee volunteers start kind of trickling in. Um, the way the uh, engagement uh, traditionally ends was that Major Moniac, um was basically trying to ascertain the depth of the water that they needed to cross to get to the seminal position. Uh, various accounts, some say that he basically let it charge across the uh, waterway. Um, others said that he was just kind of wading in trying to see how deep the water is. Um, once he's in there, he's shot dead. Um, nobody else really tries to cross the waterway. Um, as different officers make it to this point, they kind of um, parlay. It's getting late in the day. Um, it was, uh, according to some accounts, at least noon by the time they even started the engagement. So it's late in the day. It's been several hours, and they're actually starting to run out of ammunition at this point, too, or run low on ammunition. So basically seeing no clear way to, um, to overwhelm this choke point, they basically um, call an end to it. But essentially, this is the common feature that we see in all of these that there was intense fighting, a heavy firefight, and basically a concentration of shot uh, from the uh, seminal position. So that kind of leads into um, how we view, um, you know, how we view the battlefield today. So what we did when we were trying to do archaeology on, on the last engagement were basically see if we could locate some of the identifying features. And one of the ways that we did is we essentially developed models by listening to um, other researchers. Um, you know, we're not the first people to have any sort of interest in this. Um, and, uh, and then a lot of uh, local information. You know, what did local historians um, think about this? Where did they place the battle? Um, you know, the, there's not really a real town of Wahoo Swamp. Um, but it's a small community and there. They've lived, a lot of those people have lived there for a long time. They have some familiarity with the, uh, with the battlefield. Um, and there's um, one of the areas on the uh, modern day road out there is um, known as Battle Slough. 
um, you know, hence, uh, you know, named after at least its proximity to the engagement. So we consulted with different parties to see, you know, what they thought. And we basically tried to develop different models that we could then test archaeologically. Um, so when we held a public meeting at Dade's Battlefield, seeing if anyone had any information, um, we were approached by the Sumter County Historical Society. Um, uh, at that time, uh, their vice president, Arthur Hayes, um, who, who, you know, uh, it was a local. He's had family who actually um, was involved in the Seminole War, um, settled in the area shortly afterwards, and he's got a, a vested interest. Um, and so they had actually done a little bit of their own work. And basically, when it comes to interpreting, um, you know, all this, like I said, you have a lot of different accounts. There are a handful of maps. Most of them aren't particularly good. Like, for example, you know, this map clearly shows a pinch point, but what is this big vacant area in the middle? You know, you've got a lot of trees here. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of confusing to what you're looking at. Is the dense vegetation supposed to be wetland or is that the upland? Um, you know, and, and so what it comes down to on historians is kind of what features you latch on to both in the narrative and what maps um, you kind of focus on. So um, the Sumter County Historical Society um, had largely latched onto this. And this was a map that was drawn by Lieutenant Henry Prince the following spring. Now, Henry Prince is very important to Seminole or researchers because um, he was an engineer um, who was involved in the construction of multiple forts. Um, he drew a lot of maps and diagrams um, and he drew some of the best maps we have during the war. Um, so his accounts are really what we, we go for, um, for things like the Battle of Camp Izzard, um, the construction of, uh, of Fort, uh, Fort Foster. Um, you know, he provides a lot of really good information. And he provides a lot of good um, maps of the area. Unfortunately, this map is not one of them, and he was not at this particular engagement. So this is a really rough map that, as he was writing through the following year, um, kind of guessing at where some of the engagements took place. So um, the Sumter County Historical Society had really um, attached to this and they made their interpretations. And it was largely based on where is the high ground, which is what Prince would have followed along here, and the, what he notes as far as um, fields or potential villages that would have related to the battlefield. So he noted, um, I believe it's um, uh, like, uh, he, he noted several, um, uh, fields over here on the eastern side, and then they basically saw the battlefield as a series of separate actions. Um, so they defined it as in there was a battle here at Grant Slough. Um, there was a kind of a cessation in the action, and this was closer to the initial burned village as well as uh, Jumpers Village. Um, and then they basically proceeded through Seminole agricultural fields. Um, they continued up the high ground, made it to Battle Slough, um, which is where the present day highway between Floral City and Bushnell um, crosses the area. And then they continued on getting closer to the Withlacoochee River with the final engagement either culminating at Gum Slough or possibly at the river itself. And based on some of the descriptions, Moniac dies in anything from ankle deep water that's a slough or maybe a small creek, all the way to maybe he actually died in the river itself. Again, the descriptions vary greatly. Um, and so that's the way they kind of thought of, thought of it. And they had actually conducted their own metal detecting around where they thought the location of the first battle was on, on one property and found, it a, found a sizable number of musket balls. Um, and they were able to do some other metal detecting in some other areas they found some possible evidence of Spanish movement from the 1600s in the area, but weren't really able to find any sort of evidence of actions um, closer to the Withlacoochee River. Um, so another model uh, kind of focuses more on just that pinch point idea. Um, and so this kind of focuses more on the terrain. And this was kind of a model that we thought of ourselves, and then I was consulting um, Another uh, a friend of mine who's a, a fantastic researcher, uh, researcher on this subject, and he had kind of postulated that maybe the battle took place not along one of the um, 
creeks or rivers, definitely not the Withlacoochee River, or even really inside one of the sloughs, but rather in one of the marshes in between two ponds, North and Bear Lake, which are, like I said, basically big ponds or very small lakes. And this is kind of surrounded by modern day sawgrass, um, wetlands, very unpleasant area, but you can kind of see where there'd be a choke point. In addition to this, um, Jesse had some information that basically relic hunters have been um, uh, hunting or looting this area. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of this area is now conser uh, DEP conservation land, so this would be a felony. Um, and so uh, people have basically been artifact collecting this area, and he's stumbled upon other reenactors who have been, or other people who have been saying that they've been selling musket balls from the Wahoo Swamp. So based on his information, we created this model that we refer to as the Bear Lakes model, in which case the pinch point is actually um, not directly west um, from where the initial uh, engagement took place and where we know at least the Sumter County Historical Society has found musket balls already, but rather it follows this upland area on this kind of peninsula that leads up to this, this choke point up here. So they cross some wetlands over here and then they continue on to where the battle finally concludes. Um, so that was another thing to test. Ideally, we would find a concentration of musket balls following up the peninsula, and then finally at this one defensive posture. So then we have another model for the battlefield. Um, so this is kind of the more traditional model of the battlefield. Um, and this was uh, purported to us and presented to us by um, Lynn Hayes, who's actually um, a cousin of, um, of Arthur Hayes, the uh, vice president of the Sumter County Historical Society. Now, Lynn had grown up in the area and had certain information that had basically been passed down through his family, through his father and such. And basically they said that this was on traditionally where the battlefield is thought to be today on Battle Slough. Um, and that essentially there's an area where the creek kind of widens, the slough widens a little bit and there is a choke point. And that's close to where the road crosses it today. Um, so in this regard, it basically follows similarly to the first model except instead of having the second and third, or the third engagement, the battle just stops here. And so once again, in this idea, we would basically be following from the initial area of where the Sumter County Historical Society has already found um, uh, bullets or projectiles, and then it would be more directly west um, across um, Grant Slough and then into Battle Slough um, where they would have it. And then we basically kind of created our own model, model number four, which kind of combines elements of a lot of these, um, saying that maybe the US military actually went in multiple areas, um, but we would still be looking for one of these particular choke points. Um, so the idea was to see how much of this we could test. Um, of course, a lot of that's dependent, uh, contingent on whose land you can get on. Um, and then of course, whether or not you can actually find anything when you're there. So, we conducted archeological investigations, kind of continued on where the Sumter County Historical Society had left off. Um, and we basically employed uh, metal detecting, uh, use of some volunteers, but mostly uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Dean and myself were out there doing this. Um, and so what we ended up doing is we ended up finding, um, you know, a recovery um, and this, this just shows only a portion of the area that we actually looked at, but this leads the section of where um, Sumter County Historical Society has already found uh, a number of, of projectiles, and then the peninsula that leads up to the Bear Lakes that we mentioned in the second model, as well as a little bit of the high ground that leads west if you were pursuing the other two models. Um, and so the square at the bottom right doesn't show the exact location of the artifacts because I think there were something like 54 projectiles that were found by the Seminole Wars Foundation uh, before us. We were able to analyze those, but we don't have exact locations. We just know what parcels they were found on. I can't tell you within how many feet of, of anywhere. Um, so that was kind of our, our jumping off point. And we started metal detecting areas to the west. Now note that the engagement on November 18th um, started probably a mile to the east of this. However, um, basically we weren't allowed access to that property. Um, that landowner basically said, no, they don't have any, any evidence of the battlefield on their property. 
um, which is fun because even if the engagement didn't take place, troops still marched through his property regardless. They didn't teleport. Um, so, uh, but basically said, now they don't have anything there, so they might have some arrowheads and stuff, but they didn't want us looking around the property. Um, interestingly enough, the um, people who were doing some of the artifact collecting, um, in which case my other uh, uh, informant uh, told me about previous stuff that's been collected, um, said that some of the artifacts had actually been found on his property, and some of the people who may have been doing artifact and collecting were uh, associated with this guy. So basically, I wasn't able to find the early portions of the battlefield simply because people said, no, you can't have access to our property. Common problem, but that's private property for you. They can do whatever they want. So we kind of had to start off with this area. Now, there's a, a high density of projectiles, and that's likely because we think that this is probably about as far as the November 18th battle um, got. That this is probably about the point where they started um, withdrawing about the time that they reached Grant Slough, which would have been the first really good uh, seminal defensive position. Um, and so it's quite possible the density of, of uh, bullets that we're seeing is the fact that we're seeing where two battles overlapped. Um, so the November 18th and the November 21st battle probably went through this area, or at least, you know, saw some overlap here. Um, so we then kind of uh, went west and north. Now, if you look um, west, we didn't really find any um, projectiles, anything directly west. However, we did find scatters heading north up the peninsula. And we actually found the, you know, not a dense cluster, but the main cluster at this wetland, at this crossing right here. So before you can get to Bee Island, before you can get to the lakes, not really dense enough to where I would say it's the, the choke point in the description. However, it does somewhat look like that. Um, unfortunately, we didn't find a lot of artifacts when we got to the other side and we got closer to the lakes. Um, there were some issues with that in that um, uh, metal detecting in wetlands is very difficult. Uh, metal detecting around cypress knees is particularly challenging. Um, once you get into the sawgrass, it's essentially impossible without a significant fire that were to move, remove through there. Um, and then we didn't have um, uh, all the permission to get onto some of the swift mud managed lands in there either. Um, so some of those might have actually obscured what we had. On top of that, we know that some artifact collecting has at least gone on in the area, although it's unlikely that they would have pulled all the artifacts from here. So there were some challenges as far as getting into the wetlands. Um, but we basically did find that they at least moved uh, in a more northerly fashion than we previously thought. Um, in the end, uh, we basically analyzed the pre-existing um, uh, projectiles that had been found. Um, we put them in categories basically in terms of size. Um, the U.S. military muskets, they would have been using um, uh, Springfield 1816 type uh, or variants of that, um, which would have had around a 69 caliber um, barrel. So they would use uh, musket balls that'd be about 0 0.64, 0 0.65 inches um, in diameter. Keep in mind, musket balls are always smaller than the barrels themselves. Um, they're jammed in there. Um, and that, you know, they basically have to be smaller. Um, in rifled weapons, there tends to be a tighter fit and you can sometimes see the grooving on musket balls from that. Um, volunteers uh, might have used a larger variety of weapons. Uh, depending on the unit, different um, units were either assigned weapons from their home state. Uh, sometimes those were weapons that were provided from the federal government. In other cases, volunteers were actually permitted to provide their own weapons. Um, the, I'm more inclined to say that they would have used, um, because they're using cartridges, pre-made cartridges, which would have been buck and ball. Uh, which would have been one musket ball and then three smaller pieces of buckshot. Um, that th for consistency's sake, they would prefer for everyone to have the same weapon. That way it's easier to supply everyone with their ammo. They're not really expecting soldiers to be molding their own bullets or pouring in their um, uh, shot using powder horns or anything like that. Um, on, so uh, generally you attribute larger musket balls to the U.S. military, um, and then often the Seminoles are, um, would have used a whole variety of weapons. 
they would have been using captured um, U.S. military weapons. For example, at Dade's Battlefield, you've got over 100 men are killed. Um, that's 100 muskets on literally day one of the war that the Seminole procured. Um, and they would have used U.S. cartridges as long as possible. And then afterwards, they would have been loading manually, um, you know, again, powder horns or um, uh, the like. And um, so we attribute uh, lower, uh, smaller caliber balls, um, usually towards rifles, hunting rifles. For example, if you're hunting birds, you don't want to use a large caliber weapon um, because you'll literally blow the entire thing up. Um, and the Seminoles would have been using everything from captured military muskets to their simple hunting weapons that they would have used personally. Um, and then finally, you have small shot. Um, this can be anything from pistols um, to, like I said, the buckshot that comes in the buck and ball cartridges. Um, again, the problem with pistols is pistols run in every caliber. They have 0.69 caliber pistols, which has got to hurt while firing, um, but they range all the way to smaller shot. So we at least categorize them into these categories. And then we also looked at them in terms of impacted or in unimpacted, what we called fired shot, or sometimes it's referred to as drop shot. Fired shot meaning it shows where some, the location of where somebody was at and they were fired upon. Drop shot is where somebody was usually loading a weapon um, and either they dropped the cartridge or they dropped an in individual projectile and it remained on the ground unfired. So that usually exhibits where somebody was loading and firing from. And so we try to analyze uh, troop positions based on that. Keep in mind, however, that this is a moving battle. So basically each side would have a position, they would fire a volley or two, and then they'd move further down the battlefield. So you basically see overlaps of these patterns over and over again. All right, so to kind of quickly go over um, some of the uh, examples of what we found out there. So between the uh, uh, previous collections and then what we found, we had something like 100, 120 musket balls to look at, um, or different lead projectiles to look at. And so, you know, let's look at some of the kind of notable features on some of them. Um, so on the left side here, um, we've got like uh, this kind of oxidized ball here, and you can see that there's clearly a flat surface. So this is an example of a fired shot, um, probably a relatively light impact on something, probably not a rock. Maybe it was fired at long distance, low powder. Um, it clearly dented it, but didn't completely deform the ball. Um, other examples of uh, uh, C here, a uh, second from the top on the left, you can kind of see that there are striations on the left side, and that's a sign of chewing. Um, you often hear stories about the American Revolution and the Civil War, where uh, soldiers would bite balls when they would um, get like something amputated. Um, this is typically not the case. That will crack your teeth. However, pigs, pigs are common in Florida, and pigs really like to chew on lead for some reason. Um, so do other animals. Um, but you get molar marks that look similar to, somewhat similar to humans, and that's usually pig chewing. Um, on the right side across from that, you can see little tiny lines on these. Those are something like shrews or voles or mice chewing on lead, because once again, animals like chewing on lead for some reason. Um, so, you know, these are some of the kind of notable things that you'll see. Um, another case down here on the bottom you can actually see this little line that runs around the circumference. And that is um, a, mold, a mold line or a mold seam. And that indicates where somebody actually made this, bu uh, this ball personally. And notice it's a uh, 0.46 inches in diameter. So it's smaller shot. This probably would have been in a rifle. And this probably would have been molded by Seminoles. Um, as I said, you know, the military is probably using cartridges. Seminoles would have been most likely out there actually molding their own balls. So this gives us a little bit better idea of maybe seminal locations. Um, looking at some more examples, we basically see, you know, different ways that you can have fired shot from being completely pancaked to being slightly dimpled. Um, and then once again, we have more offset shot like this. This one here is particularly offset to the point where it's no longer spherical you really wouldn't want to fire that out of a gun. It would mess up your barrel, uh, probably jar you to fire. Um, 
you know, not a good, uh, you know, definitely an error either in a user error or more likely with the mold itself. Um, and we actually ended up finding several pieces of shot that had this exact same pattern, um, suggesting we were finding the location of the same individual or at least the same individual's projectiles. Um, so it is kind of notable that, you know, you do see repeated patterns out there. Um, okay, and so we've got here third from the top on the right um, is an interesting example. If you'll notice that you've got these little like U shape or these little like flat surfaces marked, that is rifling. Um, so rifling are, is just uh, grooves in barrels. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. military used smoothbore muskets at, the at this time, um, whereas rifling is usually used for personal hunting, not for military combat. Um, and again, usually comes in smaller calibers. Again, this is a .38. This would have been like a Fallon gun. But what happens is as you fire a muzzle-loading weapon, um, the powder slowly builds up in the barrel. Um, after a handful of shots, it can actually become more difficult to jam it in there. And especially in rifling where you already have a tighter fit, you really have to ram the musket ball ho uh, home. Um, if uh, you really jam it in there hard enough and lead is very, very soft, you can actually leave the marks of the rifling on the musket ball itself. All right. So probably the most interesting artifact, or at least to me the most interesting artifact that we found was on the location, the same area where the Sumter County uh, Historical Society had found most of their musket balls um, on the east side of uh, Grant Slough, um, was this trigger guard. So as I mentioned, um, the US military used a Model 1816 Springfield musket um, and variants of that. Um, so uh, you, you have notice, notable features on this uh, trigger guard here. You've got the bow, is this U-shaped thing, and then you've got this little hole in the front, and that's what we call the sling swivel hole. And so the slings, uh, the, it, for the sling swivel, it's where like a little pin goes in, and that's where you can put basically a sling or a strap on the musket. There would be another attachment closer towards the tip of the barrel, um, and basically a soldier can then throw it over their arm. Um, this is typically a feature on military weapons only. Um, so uh, people have to modify their own weapons if they want to add one. Now, for the U.S. military weapons, they didn't add this in until the 1822 variant. Um, and so that was very interesting. Um, and this generally looks like the shape of that trigger guard. Um, and so I um, emailed the curator of the Springfield Armory of uh, the, the museum at the Springfield Armory, Alexander McKenzie, very nice guy, um, and basically said, hey, can you give me the dimensions of what an 1816 or what an 1822 Springfield trigger guard would look like? He replied with, no, I can't. They don't actually have specific dimensions for their weapons because local manufacturers, the manufacturers or contractors would sometimes have slight variations on them. Um, you're not really too far away from when Eli Whitney um, developed the jig, um, which basically was used to make interchangeable or standardized parts, which would be used for muskets, was one of the early applications. Um, but basically, he said, why don't you give me the dimensions you want, I'll, de I'll measure what we've got in our collection and let you know uh, how it compares. And so I was like, okay. I, I gave him the sections that I wanted measured on his. I gave him my measurements. And he pointed out something that I had missed. This trigger guard is made out of brass. All Springfield and Harper's Ferry weapons at this time were made out, the arms furniture was made out of iron. So this was not a US military musket, um, but it still had the swing swivel. So what was it? So uh, Alexander was nice enough to talk to various other curators um, you know, that he knew to try to figure out what it is. And nobody else had this particular trigger guard in this collection. And what came back uh, was their best advice was that it was probably Spanish, uh, possibly Dutch, and that it would have been um, 18th century, not 19th century. So this suggested that this musket was a lot older than the battlefield. Um, and so this kind of led me into side research on to what degree um, is the statement that the Seminole always use state-of-the-art rifles accurate. 
Um, and as I said, you know, we know they would have had access to other military weapons, but this suggests that this could be an earlier weapon that was handed down and used for a prolonged period of time, that this could have dated from the Spanish, uh, one of either of the Spanish occupations of Florida, or maybe even the British occupations of Florida. Um, usually each time um, a group would leave Florida, they would hand over large caches of weapons to the Seminole, basically hoping that the Seminole would be problematic to their replacements. So the Spanish handed over weapons um, to the uh, Seminole, hoping that they would be a problem for the British. When the British had to hand over um, uh, Florida again, they handed over um, and continued to equip the Creeks and the, uh, Span er, and the Seminole after the War of 1812, um, or you know, well into after the War of 1812, hoping that they would create problems for the, uh, for the United States. In addition to that, the U.S. military had also launched the Patriot War, kind of a secret war for the start of the War of 1812, in which case we did similar things. They basically tried to rile up the Seminole population, hoping that they would uh, overthrow the Spanish. So, um, you know, and then on top of that, we have the issue of uh, guns, you know, while commonly available to the uh, Seminole and the Creek um, would have been very important. Um, and that they might have actually had prolonged use of weapons. And so that some of them might have continued to hand down weapons um, decade after decade, as long as they were still serviceable. In which case you'd see a whole variety of, um, of uh, stuff. So it's possible that this dates well into the early 1700s. Um, you know, we don't quite know, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll continue analyzing it and maybe we'll get an answer one day. Um, so some of the other notable artifacts, we found some other um, uh, brass and iron artifacts. Um, a lot of these could probably be related to the um, ranching activities that have gone on, such as the stirrup, could be from the battlefield, could be from several occupations, could be from, like I said, farming. Uh, same thing with this bee, um, fencing staple, and then various little bits of snipped um, brass that would have been common at this time. Uh, one notable thing here is we've got a rolled brass cone here called a Kaskaskia point, um, which is basically an arrowhead that Indians start using as early as the 1600s, making them out of essentially brass and copper um, buckets or bales and rolling these into. Hopefully in a year or two, I'll have a really good presentation on Kaskaskia points because we found a massive cache of them at another Seminole War site. Um, so it was exciting to find these in multiple locations. Um, all right, so uh, in, in addition to some of the other stuff that had been collected on some of the other properties, um, one of the landowners had found um, kale and pipes, very uh, common during this time period, as well as to settlers who would have occupied immediately after the war. Um, and then evidence of prehistoric occupations, such as spear points, um, knives, and uh, such. And then, a small amount of shovel testing, uh, or uh, shovel testing revealed a small amount of pottery. Now this has very faint little indentations on here, and this is what we call Chattahoochee brush pottery, which is Aboriginal Seminole pottery. Um, so Seminoles would have been using essentially a mixture of trade goods, so they would have had um, white wares, cream wares, uh, pearl wares, um, they would have been using glass, but they also would have been using some of their own pottery as well that has this kind of crude design. Um, so we didn't find this in large quantities to suggest that there was really a village. However, we did find it to say that there was certainly a seminal presence here. This wouldn't have probably been on the battlefield itself, but supports the idea that maybe these were actually agricultural fields, something that we had seen in Prince's map and something that we had seen in the Center County Historical Society's model. Um, so we definitely know that there was a seminal presence and this also kind of um, connects, and then the prehistoric sites kind of connect some of the high ground showing a series of trails, which we know the military used, um, uh, basically elaborated on, on Native American trails, Seminole trails. And so this is, you know, a lot of strong evidence um, for at least Seminole location and the progression of the battlefield in this area. Um, so basically to kind of summarize the battle, um, with what we found is we found uh, definitely a distinct military signature, but not a high density of shot. Keep in mind with every uh, uh, cartridge fired, that's four pieces of lead that comes out. 
and they fought for several hours a day or several hours in the day. Um, you know, the Seminole tend to slow down their rate of firing as the engagement goes on. They tend to be better at the uh, beginning of engagements. Um, they use a little bit cleaner, meth uh, cruder methods of loading. Um, they don't necessarily clean their guns as well or even at all during combat. Um, but nonetheless, we're still expecting a large volume of, of shot. Um, and the problem was, is we really weren't able to find a dense assemblage of artifacts. We found artifacts leading up of the peninsula towards the Bear Lakes, um, but we didn't find anything really at the edge of Bear Lakes themselves. When we tried to get towards Battle Slough, um, we ran into problems that, well, for one thing, this entire area has been logged multiple times. And cypress logging in particular, but as well as cedar logging is very problematic. It churns up a lot of earth. Um, and then the roads and machinery used to get in and out of that tends to cause a lot of disturbance. Metal detectors are pretty sensitive. You can get a little over a foot in depth with what we had. And then they also start to get a little wonky when you get to water. You can use them in water. You can use them on dry ground. The in-between is kind of a problem and you really have to calibrate your machine really well when you're doing that. So the closer we get to the wetlands, the more problems we have. In addition to that, we had some issues with land access around Baton Slough. Um, we were allowed on one property, however, there was a misunderstanding between a husband and wife couple to where the husband didn't realize we had permission from his wife to be out there. So we had to kind of prematurely end some of the um, uh, metal detection on that. And then we really didn't investigate much further west of Battle Slough. So we were, really weren't able to test the last portion of the Sumter County model. So what we kind of concluded was something in between. Um, is that it was not a clear engagement that moved either in a westerly or, or northerly direction, but rather it was more complex. That essentially the uh, army formed up at the edge of the hammock and formed a battle line and started in this progression um, as organized as possible. However, the wetlands and the dense vegetation quickly meant that the formation broke apart and groups started becoming more and more isolated from each other. Um, the creeks, um, who are probably more adept at, at moving through the terrain, they were more uh, fleet of foot like the Seminole, um, were more used to the terrain, followed the same tactics as the Seminole, um, were able to pursue them more aptly. Um, the regulars happened to be on the center ground, or the, the, the center which ended up being most of the dry ground as they proceeded in and were able to follow the creeks. Um, mostly on the southern flank of the battlefield as it turned um, in a slightly northerly fashion. Um, and we think that a lot of the regulars in the Florida volunteers might have actually followed up that dry peninsula, trying to stay on dry ground, hence why we get the scatter of artifacts generally leading towards the Bear Lakes um, and possibly stopping at the slough before they ever got there. The Tennesseans, on the other hand, on the extreme right flank, really don't describe a lot of combat, ended up essentially marching straight into wetlands, would have gotten bogged down in several feet of muck, and basically were twiddling their thumbs. Um, it took them hours to make any progress, and they were basically um, distant and uh, uh, distinctly separated from the rest of the unit, only able to basically follow where the engagement was um, based on uh, the gunfire. Now, if they had actually continued directly north and continued to crash through the wetlands, they likely would have run into Jumper's Village. Uh, he was one of the main Seminole leaders at the time and would have been one of the two prominent leaders at this battlefield, um, Jumper and Cloud being the two prominent Seminole leaders commanding this. Um, we know from some other accounts of the Seminole that Cloud ended up bearing the brunt of the engagement. Um, that Cloud's forces were the ones who were largely engaged on November 18th and ended up bearing the brunt um, on uh, November 21st. Uh, Jumper's forces were um, likely held in reserve because the U.S. regularly employed tactics where they would try to surround the Seminole. Seminole were keen to this and they were much better at using the train. They were prepared. So we postulate that they had provided a um, force on the north end of Jumper Creek to protect the village and that they would have provided another force um, on the east on the southern side um, and the western side of Battle Slough. 
um, basically waiting for that flanking force to come. However, since the Creeks ended up turning north, they never actually made it to them. And because the Tennesseans turned west before they got there, Jumper's forces were never really engaged and everyone focused in on clouds. Um, so basically what we were able to produce on this is what we refer to as Kakoa maps. And these are essentially required um, for these type of grants. And by Kakoa, we're just applying terrain analysis, similar to what the modern military applies, in which case you're looking at things like key terrain, observation points, cover and concealment, avenues of advance and egress, and you're basically looking at a battlefield as all of the geographic and um, physiographic features that would have impacted how a battle would, have, would operate, both from how they get there, how they leave, in addition to where they actually do the fighting. Um, so as a result of this battle, we weren't able to fully find where that concluding point was, but we were able to produce a series of maps like this detailing our speculations on, on troop movements at the time. Um, so that was quite one, uh, a presentation. So um, we have, uh, you know, of course, where can we go from here? And so, you know, while we, we like to think that our report adds, you know, the, the a significant amount of information, um, I, I think I probably should have clar clarified earlier that like that Lynn Hayes, um, who come up with our third model had actually made a brief publication um, before this couple of years, uh, a, a couple of years before we started this and had provided us with his information. So basically we provided additional historical research to try to encompass as much of the campaign as we could and a, a better description and a uh, better use of maps than we've seen previously seen. However, we can always do more archival research as Deborah can attest to, there's always more to be found in archives, and it always ends up in the weirdest spots. Um, for example, one researcher I know um, who has uh, minions all over the country looking for his stuff, once found stuff related to the Seminole Wars in Ethan Allen's collection in New York. Um, you know, so you never know where, where you're going to find this kind of stuff. And, you know, and no one's ever really been able to fully dig into the National Archives on all this. And I think uh, most of us, uh, some of the war re researchers are um, in agreement that eventually somebody's going to have to bite the bullet, live in Washington, DC for a couple of months and just go ahead and copy all the files for everyone. Um, so, you know, additional archival research can definitely lend uh, more insight into how this battle progressed. Um, in addition, you know, the more area I can search, the better. Um, I'm always limited by essentially the amount of funding that I have the uh, uh, wishes of property owners, whether they're willing to allow me on their property or not, um, how much they're willing to allow me on their property. Um, so we know if we search more area, we're gonna find different aspects of the battlefield. Even if, like I said, it's those Kakoa parts where you know we're showing where villages were nearby or troop movements were, even if it's not the battlefield itself. Um, additionally, we know that while the war moved, this was the last major engagement in the Cove of the Withlacoochee. The war largely moved south. You have major engagements at Loxahatchee and Okeechobee, and then eventually into the Tree Islands of the Everglades. Um, there were subsequent movements through here. Troops would continue to move through this area for the next six years. Um, and you have minor skirmishes that occur. Um, we see reports of soldiers, according to West Point, of being wounded or seeing action in this area, although there are no other descriptions other than there was some sort of activity. And then we know that troops would repeatedly be sent throughout here to scour because even though the Seminoles would be cleared out of an area, as soon as the US military would move out, Seminoles would move right back in. Um, and basically it's not until after 1842 that you really see the Seminoles start to stay in South Florida more commonly. Although to be fair, there are letters immediately in 1842 at the conclusion of the war talking about Seminoles in the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. So, you know, they were pretty mobile. Um, and then finally, the, the biggest portion, you know, and this is one of the biggest problems we have in Seminole Wars altogether, is there's not a lot of information from the Seminole side. Almost all the information we have are from newspapers, um, are from official reports, and are from um, discussions, you know, with Congress, with the War Department, um, journals um, and such. We get very, very few accounts of the Seminole 
Uh, most of the time, all we get are estimations of, of um, casualties or counts of numbers of uh, seminal participants. However, those at numbers are almost always inaccurate. Uh, soldiers are regularly boasting over exaggerating the numbers of enemy combatants to make their um, engagement seem more heroic or if they lose the engagement to uh, make it sound um, uh, like they did a better job or you know that they held their own. Um, and then on top of that, uh, uh, casualties are always unknown. The Seminole do a very good job of removing their dead and wounded from the battlefield and don't usually let the US military um, uh, get exact accounts. On top of this, um, so what we really need to do is we need to start looking at more things from the Seminole perspective. Obviously, there's very, very limited and written accounts. What we have are interviews usually after the war, um, but we can start looking at things like more Seminole villages. Really, no Seminole villages have been excavated well. Um, they've run, everyone's run into problems. Uh, Brent Wiseman at Powellstown is kind of considered the archetype. And Powellstown was a very brief encampment that was only there for maybe a month or two um, by Osceola um, and has almost no material culture. Um, uh, Palik Lakaha, excavated by Terrence White, ran into serious problems over disturbance due to farming and inaccess to neighboring plots and was only able to find limited uh, features of the village. And then Payne's uh, Town um, by Blakely Bailey only provided limited uh, uh, information. So we definitely need more stuff um, from the Seminole side. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, just to kind of take a lot of the bias out of all this. Um, so basically I would like to uh, uh, thank the National Park Service for uh, providing us uh, uh, funding on this. Um, I would like to thank my staff, um, uh, Jonathan Dean, uh, provided really a bulk of the field work and the writing on all this. Um, always a good partner to have. My uh, coworker Gary Ellis provided, uh, served as the grant manager for this. Um, thank you to the Central County Historical Society, all of the landowners who participated, um, and the uh, volunteers who helped us out. So um, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, my buddy Chris Kimball, is here on the line. He's willing to answer any questions you have. And if it relates to the archeology, span I'll try to make something out. Okay, we have a few questions in the chat, Sean. Um, we're running a little long, so um, just keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, Bennett Lloyd and Christopher has already answered this a little bit, but if you want to chime in, um, you mentioned it was a type of arrowhead. Were the Seminoles using bows still at the time of the battle? What distinguishes it from something like the tip of a bayonet scabbard, which would have also been rolled brass? And just so you know, Christopher said, um, bayonet scabbard has a round tip on the end, so it doesn't jab the leg of the wearer. Anything you wanna chime in with? So, um, okay, so I, I assume you're referring to the Kaskaskia point in this one, the, the rolled brass point. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Chris, um, you know, has it right on that. And then on top of that, um, scab or bayonets are iron um, at this time. Um, so the Seminole probably didn't use bows and arrows in combat um, if they did very little. Now, as the war goes on, that's basically one of the problems that they have is they start running low on ammunition. Um, and uh, you know, they, 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 yeah, they, that, that's a problem, and it's it's often considered that the Seminole, uh, they 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 like I said as the engagements go on, they fire uh, less and less ammunition. Um, so it is possible that maybe in the Everglades they would have used them from time to time. Um, now the other site that I'm working on now, where we found um, a cache of them, um, is actually right next to a uh, U.S. military encampment. We don't know if they were running at you know the same time, if they were chased off or whatever. Um, but we found basically where they were casting uh, uh, bullets there. Um, we've got knives, axes, and then they were cutting up. Um, we've got tons of sheet brass, and we've got the bale ears. So that's why a lot of times people say that they're kettles. Um, based on the thickness, it would have been buckets or bales. Um, and right now, I actually literally just sent out some samples for PXRF analysis this week. Um, that's Basically, they zap it with a ray gun, give me elemental analysis, and they'll be able to tell me exactly what it is. Uh, based on our own experimental stuff, we think it's red brass. Um, copper is easy to roll. Real brass is really hard to roll. Red brass, somewhere in between. Um, 
what I would speculate is, is that now we see these with all kinds of, of Native American groups. Kaskaskia points are named after uh, the Kaskaskia site and the Kaskaskia River in Illinois. Um, and that's early 1600s. So we know as soon as the Spanish and the French show up and they start doing trade goods, the Native Americans start manipulating um, European trade goods into something that's more functional for them. Um, or if they get things that are broken, then they reutilize them in different ways. So these aren't particular to the Seminole or the Creek by any means. Um, and um, I think what they would have been for is hunting. Um, you know, it's just, we, we, we also see where um, they'll make sometimes knives or spear points like you would make out of stone, but they'll make that out of the green bottle glass that is common amongst the soldiers and settlers at the time. Um, so what I would postulate on these is that they were used for hunting, either to conserve ammunition or um, also to basically keep their position quiet when they were in the proximity of troops. Uh, Seminoles almost always knew where the military was. The military rarely knew where the Seminoles were. Um, it was easy to follow soldiers. Soldiers probably stank. They were noisy. Um, whereas Seminoles were much more adept at using their environment, using their landscape around them. And I think they just would have done it to keep quiet. Um, a lot of the soldiers who actually die from this war don't die in combat, but actually die when they straggle off going fishing or hunting and are basically killed as individuals when they you know, let somebody know of where their position was. So th that's what I would say for that. Um, and then, like I said, I'm doing a lot of analysis with my uh, uh, associate Dan Savilich. So in about a year or two, if you guys are willing to have me back, I should be able to give a presentation on just Kostaski points.